Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Managing Highly Successful Drupal Migrations. Um, we turned the lights down so you could see the screen, so hopefully you won't fall asleep. Um, so who are the folks up here? Uh, I'm Frank Fabrero. I'm the CTO with Phase 2 Technology. Uh, I'm Michael Morris. I'm Vice President of Solutions at Phase 2 Technology. And uh, we do uh, CMS and, and web application development for um, government publishing, community building, in, in the, uh, primarily in the DC and the New York markets, but kind of all over the, the country. Um, some of the successful migrations that we've done, uh, that we won't actually talk about the details of those migrations, but kind of at a more general level, um, what are the things that we found successful across many of them. But some of the ones that we've done is uh, moving whitehouse.gov from a proprietary CMS into Drupal. Uh, we are currently migrating uh, the agency websites for the state of Georgia into Drupal out of uh, vignette and static sites. Um, we're moving uh, FEMA.gov and soon to be DHS.gov into Drupal. We've done the WashingtonExaminer.com and that was a Drupal to Drupal migration. Uh, and other things like uh, TakePart.com, The New Republic and The Nation, uh, an ESPN sports property called Bassmaster. We moved actually out of ESPN into Drupal and uh, the Wilson Center. So before we get started, I just wanted to kind of take a poll of the people in the audience. I wanted to know, um, so first I guess like, who are the, the tech folks in the room that, are, that want to know about like the tools that you'd use for migration? Okay. Um, who are the people that are just at, you know, on a team that is actually executing a migration for a client? And who are the clients that are getting migrated? All right, so there's a good mix. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the process that we go through, what are some things to look for, um, and, and kind of ways to smooth the process. Uh, up in the top right, there is a hashtag, we called it DC Migrate. So if you have any questions while we're going, you could just kind of send a tweet to that and uh, hopefully we'll get a second to kind of look through them and, and answer the questions. But otherwise, you know, when we're done, there's, there's the microphone in the, in the center of the hall right there. So. Uh, so what's a migration? Um, you know, a lot of talks here have been technical and they've been focused on like just the specific of like how do we get data from one place into Drupal. Um, but we're not really just moving kind of web pages or data when we're, when we're migrating people to Drupal. We're, we're moving their entire organization. Uh, we're, we're kind of moving their mindset from what they used to be doing into kind of the way Drupal makes you think or the way a specific implementation of Drupal makes you think. Um, and basically, we're just moving the ways that people do their job every day um, into an entirely different system. And you know, there's, there's some care that has to be taken when you do that um, in order to have a really smooth and efficient migration. All right, so first we want, we're going to talk just a little bit about uh, kind of like the characters at play when you, you know, that's involved on these projects. All right, so um, most of you know there's a lot of different people that get involved in these kinds of projects, and we're just going to focus on a couple of key ones. Um, you know, we're not going to try to be too obvious, but there are some interesting characteristics about the roles that are being played and um, how you may approach some of these folks. So obviously one of the most important are the people that are maintaining the content. Um, generally these folks are probably coming off of former systems that they probably don't like. Um, they have lots of complaints. They've been very frustrated. Um, you know, they, they are completely dependent on things like WYSIWYGs, but yet they hate them at the same time because none of them are very good. Um, you know, some folks don't understand even, even basic concepts like the fact that you can write a piece of content once and then display it anywhere. You know, they may be coming off of more kind of like static web page builder type systems. Um, so there's, there's a lot of concepts that for Drupal developers and for web, web developers in general that just have to be explained. Um, you know, they also probably write really bad markup. They're used to being able to go in and create HTML tables and put styles in there and kind of do whatever they want and, you know, most of that. Well, we're going to get into why that's all a problem later on. Um, you know, be really careful of features that they have fallen in love with. You know, there's probably something about their old system that they really like and that they want to keep, so make sure you ask them and, um, you know, always, always keep them in mind. Um, and then you have to be really aware of things like 
um, you know, newsletter signups and analytics and ads and things that the website owners have, have, you know, that are very important to them and make sure that those kinds of things don't get messed up during um, a data migration. So <clears throat> the next group of people are kind of what we call uh, the technical owners. They could either be, um, you know, managing the infrastructure that these systems are running on. Um, but then in any case, they have to maintain the technology. Um, and sometimes they're very protective of, of their environments and, and what you're allowed to run in. So, you know, we say up here, does it run on IAS3? I mean, we actually get asked those questions sometimes. Um, so, so you have to kind of be careful. Like, you just don't come in and say, oh, all of this is crap, and you have to run on, you know, this, this latest up-to-date stuff because in many ways you might actually be threatening their jobs. So uh, it's important to kind of win them over, bring them along, and help them understand the challenges of hosting uh, a Drupal site. Um. Yeah, so th this is one you, you guys all probably know uh, people like this on your projects or in your organizations. Um, you know, this the saboteur, and they, they generally can take on different forms. Um, you know, a lot of cases it could be a team that maybe you're replacing, like a previous vendor or a previous um, web maintenance group. So there's going to be sensitivities to, uh, to that. Um, more times than not, you know, in a, in a pretty big, robust website, there's going to be um, external systems involved, either authentication systems or data that's being pulled in from various places. And those systems are going to have owners um, that you'll have to interface with. Um, you know, they might be a little bit standoffish. Um, so, you know, make friends with, with, kind of, with those kind of folks that you're, that you're going to depend on to complete your job. Um, security guys, uh, you know, security is really important, obviously. It's a huge focus. There's been a lot of presentations here at DrupalCon about it. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not trying to paint them in a bad light, but, you know, just to be aware that, you know, you'll have to do things and check boxes and do testing. And we actually talk about secure review later in this, but, um, you know, I have run into a few security people over, you know, over the years that, that um, you know, tend to be uh, blockers more, more than, than helpers. Um, and then outside auditors, um, that's another thing that you may encounter, folks that have to come in and review code and um, review project management processes and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm not saying they're all bad, they're not all trying to sabotage your project, but they, there's, you know, characteristics and elements about those folks that you have to, you know, you really have to adapt to their way of thinking in order to be able to work with them. Um, another one is, you know, hopefully there's always a project champion. So hopefully somebody who owns the website, um, whether they're paying the bill for it or whether they are, uh, you know, an evangelist of the technology or whatever, um, luckily there's, there's, there's always going to be somebody on your side. So identify those folks, use them to your advantage, um, make sure that they can help you. Um, in return, you know, communicate with them very clearly and effectively, make sure that you're staying within scope and on budget and on schedule. And, um, you know, first and foremost, make sure that they feel they're really getting value out of the work that you're doing and make sure that they feel like, you know, there's a good reason that we're migrating this, you know, all of this content and moving a website from some other technology to, to Drupal or even from Drupal to Drupal. <clears throat> um, along with that are expectations. So, you know, this is a, this is a really common thing that we encounter a lot when we're doing projects. Um, you know, you're always sort of being evaluated. Is Drupal really as good as, as everybody says it is? You know, how, you know, you're being compared to like former systems. Um, so, I, you know, I think, again, it's all just like part of, part of an overall package and an overall approach to a project that when you're dealing with different individuals, try to key in, key in on the things that, they're, uh, that are important to them and make sure that you're addressing their concerns and setting the project up for success. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that we have a section called people is that, um, you know, I'm assuming that most people here can actually execute a good site build and, and technically perform everything that's needed to, to have a successful launch, but if you overlook the people aspect and the organizational aspect of getting somebody onto a new platform, I mean, a simply bad handling of people can cause something to be perceived as a failure as, instead of a success. Now we'll talk about preparation. All right, so this is a big one. Um, this is, without a doubt, one of the most difficult parts of any uh, migration project is, is estimating it. 
Um, and I wish I had some kind of silver bullet that I could, uh, you know, provide to you that, that is the surefire way of making sure that your estimates are, are um, perfect every time. But no, no, ours, ours are. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have to really factor in a lot of things. You need to factor in organizational complexity, how many people are going to be involved. Um, you know, every person kind of adds a communication line, and those factors start to build up. Um, you know, look at how many, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways to try to estimate. You can sort of think of like, well, how many people is it going to take to do this? You know, how many developers am I going to need to write scripts? How many QA folks am I going to need? Um, you can also look at, um, you know, just historical evidence if you've done it before. I mean, that's obviously one of the most common ways to, to try to do estimation. Um, and then some of it's just gut feel, you know. If you're going in and looking at the data and you're like, man, there's just a lot of stuff in here that doesn't look good. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's a little bit of a gut instinct. Uh, I think that the most successful way to, to try to do um, the actual move of the data itself, and today we're kind of talking about a lot of things, but we will talk about actually moving content from one system to another. Um, try to get a look at it first, you know. Um, don't just throw a number out there based on the number of pages. You know, really look at the source data, try to evaluate it, understand how complex it is, understand the relationships. Um, and then you have to sort of factor all this in and, um, and give some kind of estimate, so. And, and kind of how you present the estimate in a lot of cases will, will affect the opinion of it. If you go incredibly detailed to a line item number where you have like tasks estimated at one hour, you know, you might be conveying a false sense of fidelity that you know every single thing that's gonna happen and, and down to the hour or half hour how long everything's gonna take. So you have to be careful kind of with the level of detail that you go into with your estimates because um, you might be, you know, setting up the wrong expectations. So when you do a migration, um, there's lots of opportunity. Um, you're coming out of a lot of times old systems, um, you know, unstructured content, things like that, and it's a really great opportunity um, to reorganize the content. So don't necessarily just, you know, take these blobs of HTML and, and move them over into a new system directly. Um, move the data into the new technology. So uh, reevaluate your information architecture and your navigation, uh, whether you go from unstructured to structured, if that's actually possible. Um, you know, evaluate a better use of taxonomy and navigational structures, um, and obviously, uh, it's a great time to refresh stale, uh, outdated designs and, and sometimes brands. Yeah, I'll add to that too. I mean, one of the things that we encounter a lot is you, you really have to do this in order to even get the project paid for sometimes. I mean, it's, it's a hard sell to just say, well, I'm just going to replace the underlying technology. Um, but, you know, the people that are paying for that will like, well, so what's different? You know, what do I really get out of it? They may not really understand the value of that. So um, it really is good to, when you're going to undertake all of this technical lift to try to make a move like this, make sure that you're giving the stakeholders and the users of the site and the readers something out of it by making it look better, making it navigate better, and making the content better. So it's a really good opportunity to kind of take a holistic approach to improvements. So site architecture is another thing that, that you obviously encounter when you're building a new site in Drupal. Um, uh, and you have to basically, I mean, it, it goes without saying, you have to take into account the needs of the organization and what they're trying to do with their content and how, how everything is going to be structured. Um, there's no sense in moving over all this content and doing like a big, a big lift there to be, to be putting it in a platform that's either flimsy or not suited to, to their goals. So some of the decisions that you have to make, you know, are you going to build their site on a distribution, uh, something like Open Public or Open Academy or something like that? Um, is, uh, are you building a platform for them? So are you basically building a customer-specific distribution that can support um, multiple sites, whether through uh, your standard multi-site or something more like a virtual site or a domain access model? Uh, are you going to use organic groups? Um, and then, you know, kind of take it down another level. Do all the tools that they need already exist, or are you going to have to start creating some tools or some concepts that don't exist? Are you going to have to create new layers of functionality that, that kind of combine many building blocks that are already out there? A lot of these decisions um, you should know up front. There's nothing worse than kind of being three quarters of the way through a project and you don't really know how you're going to solve a particular tricky aspect of how they want to present data or organize their content, uh, only to be presented with the fact that you actually can't or, or it's going to require, you know, another month just to get it done. 
And this one's pretty self-explanatory, but we felt pretty obligated to talk about it. I mean, clearly, any project that's going to be successful um, requires good communication, good planning. Um, the, you know, one of the things that we're always grappling with is kind of the right level of transparency. You know, we work for a lot of people that um, really want to see every little detail. You know, they want to get into our ticketing system and, and evaluate, you know, every single thing. Um, and that can be great, but, you know, they're also going to be seeing the sausage being made, and that's not always a great thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, make sure you have good project management, good folks that can um, plan out these activities because it's, you know, there's a lot more to it than, than just simply the technical aspects of it, um, which is what we're going to get into next. So, some tools and some tips. <clears throat> Not these kind of tools, um, but we're going to talk about technical aspects and some considerations uh, when migrating. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about are, are data sources. Mike said earlier it's important to get a look at the data that you're that you're moving from, um, and you know some things that you need to really carefully evaluate is what format is the data in? Are you getting it at spreadsheets? Um, is it static HTML files? Direct database access? Sometimes you get these proprietary formats, and if you get those, do you have the right libraries in order to kind of uh, extract and investigate the data? Uh, is it structured or unstructured content? Uh, like kind of the difference is, is it just some blob of HTML that represents a page or do you have the title separate than the subtitle? Uh, is the author separated or is there a separate uh, section for tags? Um, a lot of that will help determine the level of effort required to get it into the new system. Uh, another question is how do you access the data that, that you're given? Um, do they email you files? Do they put it in a Dropbox? Do you have FTP access? Do you actually have an API that you could use to extract the data? Um, do you have direct database access? And a really important thing, are you actually relying on other people in their organization to give you this data? Um, and if so, like what's their responsiveness? Um, and then other things to consider is when, you, when you're looking at the data, where are you migrating it? Is it all going into nodes? Is it going into taxonomies? Do you have to build menu structures? Um, what about media, things like images, PDFs, um, video? Um, do they want to migrate like their blocks and callouts and the, you know, the little custom ads that they might put on the sides? Um, do they want to actually migrate landing pages themselves or are those going to be built after the fact? Um, so when we're talking about moving data, it's important to get um, a process that you can kind of run it, verify, rewind it, so basically pull the data back out tweak it and run it again. So getting these automated processes of moving data is very important for verification. Um, and also having a dedicated content verification system that isn't the system you're developing at that time. Um, so another thing is when you're moving data, uh, especially from an old system that might actually have something resembling structured data, um, if you're going to be able to run it, rewind it, and repeat it, or update just individual content items as you tweak your migration, it's really important to track what the legacy ID of these items are and what this, the new source system destination is um, so that you could do selective upgrades. Um, and another thing is do things like create reports uh, that have um, content that you might think that there's a discrepancy in or something that needs to be reviewed. Um, it's great if you could somehow identify content that you think could be a problem so that there's a checklist for people to verify. Um, so some specifically some ways of moving data from one site to another um, you could do direct SQL queries out of one database into another. Um, you, could, you could extract data through RSS or Atom uh, or XML out of one system and then use uh, a module like feeds to import it into your new system. Um, you could use the views module, like let's say you're moving from an older Drupal system. You could, you could add the views module if it's not already there and you could create APIs to get at their data as XML or JSON and then um, use that with modules like Migrate or you know, custom scripts that you've written to transition the data from one system to the other. Um, so I mentioned the Migrate module, which is a, a really great um, you know, OO approach to doing automated migration and transfers. Um, it it's kind of has like a pipeline process where you can do, uh, you could tweak the data and reformat it and structure it on the way in. Um, and then there's also professional services like Acquia's migration service, so you could actually outsource it if you think it's a heavy lift or it's a system that you're completely unfamiliar with, it's a technology you've never seen and you feel too intimidated, uh, or you want somebody else to be on the hook. Frank, why don't you talk a little bit about the importance of um, going through, you know, like node saves and things like that versus just writing directly into right. the database. Yeah, so as you're building the system, a lot of times modules will um, 
they'll kind of intercept save operations and do things like, like when you save a node through the, through the node edit form, um, it'll take the title and it'll create a path alias for it so you can have a clean URL. So if you just extract your, your content from a, a, a source system and put it right into the node tables, you miss operations like that that happen and you have to account for them. So that's why modules like Migrate are, are really efficient is because they actually put content through the normal saving process and updating process that it would go through as you were using the CMS yourself. So a lot of things like, you know, if you have automated tagging services or, like I said, path, audio, uh, path aliases and, and things like that. So. Cool. so once all this data makes it over, it usually looks perfect, right? Um, boy, I mean, this, so this is where the fun starts, you know, for, for folks like me. Um, I don't do a lot of the script writing anymore, um, but, you know, I, I, I work with the teams that are doing QA and kind of looking at this data and trying to make sure that, you know, we're getting an actual nice looking website out of it. So, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll find everything. You'll find everything from just poorly formed HTML. Um, you see a lot of, uh, sometimes really crazy stuff, people will just take embedded JavaScript and you know, flash tags or whatever, just things that if they had the flexibility to put whatever they wanted to in the body of the content of the former system, you know, if they had the ability to, then they definitely did. Um, and then other things which aren't, you know, aren't, aren't quite as uh, malicious but are things that they do, um, inline links. So if they're linking within their website and their hard coding paths and things like that, um, inline styles, you know, you always encounter a lot of styles and um, you have to make sure that you are handling those properly. Um, either have equivalent styles on the new system that can match up and can kind of highlight, you know, treat block quotes and things like that the same way or come up with translations. So, you know, writing scripts that will um, grab a style and rename it to something else to so a new style that, that's going to that's gonna match your new theme. <coughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit just about like what are some of the good and bad things about moving data. So uh, if you just move the data from wherever it was to your new system, um, it'll work, but it's not necessarily the best thing. Um, you know, something better might be, like I mentioned earlier, to as you're moving the data over, I try to identify if there's things like if there's embedded links and there's, there's uh, like links to PDFs or image references, flag them so that at least you can have a list of things that people need to review manually. Um, even better is to perform scripted cleanup. So as you're migrating the data, use things like regular expressions and, and strip out inline styles. Um, and then, you know, kind of the best thing over there is as you're moving data and you're cleaning it up to also uh, translate asset resources and embedded, uh, embedded links um, so that the content when it hits your new system is, is perfect. So what are some of the cleaning supplies that you could use to actually do the cleanup that we just mentioned? Um, so, uh, Regular expressions is, is fourth on this list, but it's really number one. Uh, most of the time you wind up having to do things like strip out bad tags and translate tags, and regular expressions are really like a great thing for that. But there are other tools out there like Google Refine. Like sometimes people think Google Refine is really just like a, a spreadsheet tool, but it actually allows you to do like a lot of data manipulation and, and changes across whole, whole swaths of data. So if you're getting your data in spreadsheet format, this is actually sometimes a really good tool. Um, and it, even in other cases, if it's not given to you in spreadsheet format, sometimes you might want to export it into a CSV, move it into Refine, do some tweaks, pull it back out as a CSV, and put it into the database again. So, so it could be a many-step process to clean up your data. So you could consider it like a pipeline, and each step has, a, has its goals. Um, and that's what, you, that's what you do with Yahoo Pipes. You can actually... Um, put together these pipelines of content processing uh, to go from one source of content to, to like a finalized source. And it works really good if you have uh, feed data like RSS or Atom. And then another thing is uh, things like XPath and XSLT, if you want to actually dive into the markup itself, if it's well-structured uh, HTML, you could dive into the markup, identify and remove certain tags. Um, and XPath is actually one of the, the good tools for identifying things that you might want to flag later. So uh, there's a lot more than just markup that's being brought over. Um, you know, everybody has lots of different things on their website. Um, obviously, we, we find lots of images and, and videos and assets, lots of P PDFs. Um, you know, usually there's some treasure trove of 
some folder that has you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of PDFs that have to be pulled over and um, you know those those assets are being linked to all throughout the markup so you really kind of need to be prepared to spend a lot of time in this area um, you know you have to one of the things we encounter are um, you know like access control issues so if you're building a site that has kind of group based permissions you need to think about where the files are being stored and usually they're probably coming just out of a file that or out of a, a directory that may have subdirectories and you need to either maintain some kind of division on the on the other side or come up with some other plan so there's usually something that has to be worked through there um, like and I already mentioned but there's always going to be references to these things so um, again that's where you know in the previous stuff we're talking about you got to write scripts to go in um, if you're pointing to if you if you you know you if you can keep the same path that you had in the old system that's a, that might be fine um, but if you can't, you need to make sure that you, you translate them. And another thing to consider is, you know, in, in a lot of older systems, you'd, you'd link directly to a PDF, but in something like Drupal, you could have fields that are specifically for referencing images and, and uploads. So you might, you might need to consider um, figuring out which things are embedded and moving those into a more structured um, asset relationship if you're going to uh, use that field to, for example, display a list of like related attachments or something like that. Um, so then also when you're moving things like uh, like media specifically like images and video um, where are you where are they going so they were probably just in a directory in the old system um, are you going to maintain the the self-hosted uh, video and images um, or are you going to move them to something like Vimeo or bright Cove or YouTube which is which is much better um, or are you going to actually move them to something like a, a content delivery network um, and if you do things like that you might have to have URL redirects in order to make sure that they're referenced properly um, and then also, whoops, also when you're moving, um, are there media player changes? Are you going to use like a different, a different player? Yeah, in a lot of cases, um, depending on the video solution, you know, we don't always recommend a different one. If, if, you're, if you've already got Bright Cove and Vimeo and that's working great, um, or YouTube, you know, YouTube embeds work really well. And, you know, we're not always suggesting you have to go out and get some high priced video solution, but, um, at a minimum, you've got to think about how how those that content gets moved over, and or at least references to it. You know, in the case of like YouTube embeds and things like that. So, um, you know, there's always like some trickery involved in in moving over. Videos. And when you move to a service, um, you also have to consider um, how are they going to be adding new ones. Are you going to integrate that through a WYSIWYG? Is it through a media field, um, a video embed URL, or something like that? So those are more things to consider. Legacy URLs are always a very fun, a very fun situation to be dealing with, um, and it's really tricky too. Um, you know, there's some there's some bad ways to do it, like having no redirects whatsoever. Um, in which case, you're going to lose a lot of traffic. You'll probably fall in your Google rankings considerably. Um, there's really bad things to do, like like generating uh, over hundred thousand uh, redirects and then putting them in a dynamically loaded file, like an HT access file. Um, and then wondering why every single page load takes 45 seconds. There's other solutions like the global redirect module, which um, basically bootstraps Drupal. It, when there are 404s, it actually looks to see if there's a redirect, and, uh, and then it'll send you there. Um, well, that's, that's good because you could be reviewing the Google Analytics or other analytics and figure out what the remaining 404s are and then use this module to account for them as well. Um, the bad part is that you actually have to load up uh, Drupal for a request that's just going to be a redirect. Um, some better things are to do uh, pattern-based redirects. So some type of regular expression that you could put in like a statically loaded um, uh, web server configuration. Those can be execu executed pretty quickly, um, especially if you're using something pattern-based. You, you might only have to evaluate you know, 40 or 50 options instead of 100,000. And then ideally, you do something like redirects at the edge. And what the edge means is like if you're using something like a content delivery network, a lot of times they'll have support for redirects. So the best redirect is one that doesn't have to get to your site until you're actually loading the page that they're after. Frank, what's the best way to keep track of URLs that come from an old system? Um, and you know, do those get delivered in like a spreadsheet and they have to get parsed and put into some kind of like what, 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 what's, what's the best like process for actually doing that? Yeah, so a lot of times you could use um, 
like a lot of times what we'll do is we'll look at some analytics, uh, like Google Analytics, we'll take like the top 100 URLs and we'll start there and we'll see, well, do these actually maintain their, their paths from one system to the other? And then if not, you'll, you'll determine from this path to this other path, you'll create a spreadsheet and then you could sometimes automatically generate um, through regular expressions or something like that, uh, through a, you know, a scripting language like Perl, you could generate what the redirects would look like. Yeah, and the number of redirects that you ultimately choose, I mean, it's kind of up to you. Um, you know, a good starting point is to take your, you know, top 100 most traffic pages. But, um, you know, for, for a lot of sites, that's just not good enough. I mean, you have, to, you have to keep track of every single one of them. And that's where some of these other, you know, you, you can't just dump all of those into your HT access file or you'll have yeah. big problems. But it's really important to monitor your site in, in like, the, the few months after launch to see what, what is still um, a 404. And you could use your web server logs for things like that. You could, it's really easy to filter out based on status code. For those that don't know, a 404 HTTP, HTTP status code means not found. So you could filter your access logs for 404s. So once the content is, you know, once you've done a lot of these things, um, it's absolutely crucial that the people that are, that can evaluate the content, because nobody's going to know the content better than the folks that maintain the website, you've got to get them in early. Um, and this is where you've got to be willing to kind of let them see stuff that's a work in progress, and they need to understand that it's a work in progress and evaluate it appropriately. But um, you know, very early review. You know, get them involved in the, like the iterative process. You know, let them know like, you know, you're going to run a new, you're going to you're going to rerun your scripts like you know every night, and they can come in the next day and see how how much better they've gotten. Um, so that's that's obviously really important. Um, yeah, I just said some of that. So make sure you run it multiple times. Um, another really tricky thing is trying to coordinate the, mic the, the moving of content with the building of the website that will host the new content. Um, and with Drupal, this is an interesting problem because you can make, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the theme, your, your whole theming process might be running like a little bit behind um, the rest of your development process. And you may have a site, you know, we call it a, a skeleton site or an unthemed site. Um, and if you want to be using that to kind of stage your content um, migration, that's great. Um, make sure you explain that and make sure that the person that's doing the reviewing on the stakeholder side, make sure that you kind of trust that they can evaluate the content without having to see it in its perfect final form, um, which is sort of the best thing to do if possible. If you, can, if you have enough time and you can coordinate some of these things in more of a series, then you can actually be pushing content in to um, a staging site that's, that's pretty fully built out. It's got most of the functionality. It's already been themed. Um, and it will sort of feel a lot more comfortable to someone who's trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the, of the migration. And when you're doing this, and you know, this is a slide I wanted to put in here, because believe it or not, this is something that can really be confounding to folks if you're not really careful. But, um, Generally, in a project like this, you're going to have multiple environments. You're going to have an integration environment where developer code's coming together. You're going to have a staging environment where you're looking at content. And you, know, you may have a production environment, um, which you will at some point. Make sure that you're very clear about what is happening on each of these environments. Make sure that you're naming them correctly with subdomains or something like that. Um, make sure that the folks that are looking at the content understand that they might, like, I'll just give you a scenario. I'm looking at a piece of content that got pulled in from an automated script, and I'm looking at it, and I see problems. And, in, and when I'm seeing problems, I'm actually seeing like functional bugs, like, oh, well, this, this navigation thing didn't work right, or this widget didn't work right. And it has nothing to do with the content, but it's natural that people are going to find those kinds of bugs. So they're going to report those bugs, and then you fix them, but you might not be fixing them on the actual content staging site. Um, you might want to fix them in another site. So it's, it's pretty common for us, especially in big ones, where we try to keep our content environment fairly stable um, because you don't want it to be constantly changing. You want to be able to you know, kind of compare apples to apples when you're, when you're doing these iterative runs of your scripts. Um, and it's hard to do that if you're trying to change like, all these variables at one time. If you're fixing a bunch of bugs and functionality and doing a bunch of theming changes, and trying to do content migration all at the same time, and people trying to you know, do manual tweaks of content, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and it just gets really confusing. So just make sure that you're very, you delineate these environments very carefully. Um, use something like the environment indicator module, or you know, put a big 
red flashing banner or something on, you know, so people can understand what, what site they're actually on. Social and semantic integration. Um, so these are things to test as you're migrating content, as you're building out site functionality. Like, have you implemented open graph tags? Um, have you tested what your articles will look like uh, if somebody shares it on Facebook or shares it with Twitter? Like, these are all things that you should go through as part of your process. Um, to get into more of like the, the semantic web and, and technical aspects that help with search, like have you specified uh, RDFA uh, properties for your content through, through the Drupal hooks? Um, are you not using RDFA, are you using something like microformats or microdata? Um, you know, have you, and then once you've specified these things, have you sent them through a validator to validate that they're actually readable and that they're structured correctly? Um, and this should be part of the process all along. It's very easy to have you know, some potential theming changes actually mess up your, um, your microdata or, or RDF, RDFA markup. So um, part of the process should, should always be a verification of these things. And um, you know, one of my favorites is I think you should always use that Mebo toolbar. That thing is awesome. It sits at the bottom of your site and pops things up all over the place. It's really great. Yeah, it loads really fast too. Yeah, <laughs> makes your site fast. Uh, code reviews. So this isn't really um, part of like a data migration and this is I think just a best practice <coughs> in, in every site build. Um, Code reviews are important because having many eyes on your code um, makes it better, it catches bugs, um, and the important thing is keeping the customers happy through a migration, and, and when they're moving to a new tool, if they see things constantly breaking, or if they report a bug and you fix it, but when you fix it, you break something else, like that, that kind of erodes their confidence in the system. Um, so, you know, code reviews should be trying to ensure things like consistency and reuse and isolation. Like, like one thing that, that could be a big problem is, you know, something might not be themed correctly in one, in one place, and when you update the CSS, it actually unstyles another page. So um, trying to look for things like overlapping CSS selectors, um, things like hard coding, um, the pre-processed data munging, like if you use hook pre-process to, to shift data around or reformat it a lot, um, those things can actually affect uh, negatively how the site looks and, and how it functions and, and how stable it is. So, you know, not everybody has an organization big enough to have multiple eyes looking at code, but, you know, so if you just have one guy and that's all you have, then that's great. Um, but ideally, uh, you'll have many eyes looking at your code. Um, if you use a system like GitHub to develop your site, there are these things called pull requests. So if you have multiple people working on a code base, they can each fork it into their own repositories and then um, basically issue requests to have that code reintegrated in with the mainline. And it's a good opportunity. It's, like a, it's basically like a gate where the code has to come through a gate and someone has to look at it and they could say, okay, everything looks good. There's nothing out of, out of whack. And sometimes like you might not review every single line of code, but it's a good indication. Like if, if it's a ticket to, uh, to fix uh, the blog, you know, a blog feature that you have and you, in looking at the code change, you realize that there's actually like a whole bunch of changes to some module that you never even considered. It's like a good opportunity to go look and say, oh, did they mess up something while they were doing it? Uh, and a tool that we use and we like a lot is a tool called uh, Crucible. Uh, from a company called Atlassian, and it, it, it's actually a formal code review tool that allows you to upload uh, change sets uh, or whole files or whole modules or whole sites, and it allows for threaded discussions on any given line of code, so it's a, it's a really good tool for uh, ensuring uniformity and making sure that other people are looking at your code. Sorry, what was that again? The tool, it's called Crucible. Security reviews, um, those are also important, uh, very important. Um, you know, and some, some, for some clients it's more important than others, um, but in general a hacked site is bad for everybody. It's bad for your client, it's bad for the, the company's perception of you and your work, and it's bad for Drupal, so we think code review, uh, security reviews are also important. Um, so, you know, there, you could do none, uh, and you know, for some people that's perfectly acceptable as long as you follow like secure coding practices in Drupal. There's actually a page on Drupal.org about it. Things like uh, check, you know, check plane and verifying content and using input filters correctly in, uh, in the HTML text areas. Um, but then you could also do automated tests. You could use tools like uh, Drupal Scout. Um, there's Acquia Insight tools for security. 
Um, there's also automated penetration testing tools that you could use. And then the last one, um, which really only applies in a very small number of cases, IV and V is independent verification and validation. And it's basically having a third party come in and perform a security audit. It usually involves you giving them the code and they perform what's called static code analysis where they have ways to scan the code to look for bad practices like things that might be uh, SQL injections, um, cross sites, and then, and then they'll run tests against a stood up instance of your site to test for things like cross site scripting attacks um, which can actually compromise administrators. So that's the tools and tips part. Uh, now we're going to talk a, a little bit about um, the transition, which is kind of as you're as you're finishing up, you know, a lot of the work and you're and you're preparing to go live. So some of this stuff is probably self-explanatory. So we'll we'll try to move through a little bit quickly so we can have time to get some questions going. Um, you know, obviously training is is really really key when you're doing this kind of thing. Um, it generally takes longer than you think it does. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. You know. I'm a big fan of the good old in-person, let's all get in a room, let's put everything up on the screen, let's go through it, let's spend a lot, you know, a, a lot of time together. Um, I even like to get people, I think it's a good, good technique to get them out of their office, like have them come to, you know, if you're building the site, you know, away from their office, like get them out of their like daily work routine, you know, don't let them check email and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of other ways too. Uh, obviously, screencasts are, are really cool. They they are really helpful. I find they tend to get out of date pretty quickly. So, um, screencasts are usually our best success we've had with doing screencast type training is in little small pieces, like you know a minute long or five minute long, like a little a little thing that um, can kind of they they can just go back and reference fairly quickly. I think if you're going to put together like a really long um, you know 30 minute training video. You could probably regret that because it'll probably be out of date pretty quick. I think the screencasts that actually work best are when you do a training, just record it. And then you could post it for them to look at later. Because a lot of times, a training, you're, just, you're kind of overwhelming them. It's like an hour or two or three hours of all this new stuff. And sometimes they're still thinking about old things you've shown them as you're going over new things. So it's helpful um, to have this so that they can go back and reference and kind of watch it a few times and understand it. And then sometimes you can't always get people in the same room and you don't want to necessarily have to perform the same training again and again and again. So if you actually, um, if you actually record that training, they could just share it internally to their organization. Yeah, they can also share documents. And obviously doing um, documentation is, is a good way. Um, again, that's probably one of the things I wouldn't like go super overboard on. Um, we, we like more of kind of like a quick start. We could even call it a quick start guide or more of a reference guide. Put some screenshots in there, like some of the most commonly performed tasks like, you know, entering in an article or, you know, creating a menu item or whatever. Um, so, but yeah, there's a lot of ways of doing that. Um, when you're going through this, you know, usually we're trying to time training to happen right before the time when we give everybody the keys to the new house. So. They've been trained, they get their logins, they go in, um, and this is when, you know, if you've done a really good job, this can go really smooth or, you know, all hell could break loose. Um, so your folks are seeing the, the site for the first time, they're seeing all of their content in there, they're starting to visualize it, um, you know, they're going back and they're scrutinizing it against their design comps and they're checking their requirements list and things like that. So um, have a really good QA and feedback loop. I think this is where I see, um, a lot of organizations kind of fall down in this, and it sounds really simple, but um, it really does take like a really good process. Make sure that there are ways that um, the, the people that are reviewing the site can can you know submit bugs to you either through some kind of system or you know shared Google Docs even might be okay. I mean, it tends to it can get a little bit out of hand. Um, you know, we tend to use uh, we use Jira, uh, another Atlassian product. Um, and you know we, we've used it for 10 years and we love it. So if you don't have some kind of ticketing system, you should get one. <laughs> yeah, visibility is the most important thing. They want to know that, that people have looked at or commented on or, or even just rec uh, acknowledge the fact that they've accepted these, uh, you know, the feedback that you're getting. And then also it might be, it's a good opportunity if they actually have access to your system to, pr you know, to, to ask them uh, for things like clarification, like they might say this isn't working, and then you'll say, well, can you give me a screenshot or a detailed steps to, to reproduce it? Yeah, we also use another Atlassian plugin called Bonfire, which is kind of cool because you can start testing sessions and do screenshots and submit test tickets right, in, right into um, the ticketing system, which is kind of nice. 
Um, give your folks plenty of time to prepare their content for their launch. Um, you know, do not schedule the completion of your automated migration, um, you know, the, right up to the day before they're supposed to launch. You know, I think minimum several weeks, you know, a month is, is, is not uh, too long to, to give, give people time to uh, be comfortable with their content, um, you know, start working on their home page because that's going to be the most important thing to them. Um, and then, you know, there might be just a lot of manual work that has to happen. They maybe like they want to go back into some archives and do some tagging now that they've got taxonomy in place. Um, so just give give your the editors like plenty of time to, to go in there and do that. And that actually impacts how you do your migration. So if your <coughs> migration is just one big move everything at once and you want to do it a few weeks before launch, then that means potentially two weeks of dual content entry until you launch. So another way that you could do it is you can uh, build your migrations to have, I guess, what they call high watermarks. So you know you you track what the last um, what the last piece of content that you imported was or what the date was, and then you could start again from that point forward. So you could just move subsets of your content over. So you could move it over a month before, and then the following Monday you could move over that last week's worth of work, and each Monday you could move over the previous week or each night you can move over yesterday's content so developing the migration scripts can actually help with uh, the content prep oh and also remember uh, to clear out test content before you go live remove all the pictures of cats yes. right so one of the things that we do is 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 early in the process we actually add flags to all of our content that allows you to just hit a checkbox and mark it as test so then later on when you're going live one of the steps that you have is you you search for everything that has this test checkbox and then you could just kind of bulk delete them all at the same time you can also add flags for um, like final so if an editor has looked at a, at a piece of content and they're completely happy with it and just mark it final and um, then they know that like don't yep. touch it. And then you could run reports and tell them how much of, you know, what percentage of their content has been reviewed and like where you are at various steps in the process. Pre-launch, this is always the fun part. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we try to do is really pick the launch date carefully, um, taking into account uh, weekends, holidays, vacations, things like that. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've had clients try to launch a site on like December 28th or something like that. It's like the week between Christmas and New Year's. A lot of people take vacation or, or somebody wanted to launch their site on January 1st and, and things like that. So, so really work hard and plan with the client and be reasonable. Um, and, and, you know, ideally you can be done and launched and in the production, the, what we call, I guess, a pre-production environment for a week. And then it's really just a matter of flipping switch. And I would also expect it to slip because you know, that's just kind of the way things work, right? I mean, um, most of the slips that we see um, are often, you know, it's not that we didn't get something done, it's that the organization that owns the website is just not ready to go. You know, they haven't had enough eyes on the content, they haven't gotten various approvals, um, you know, or they decide at the last minute they want to add some more stuff. <laughs> so there's any number of things that kind of push that launch date back, but um, you know, for, for, for the developers, like, kind of be prepared for this. Like, don't expect your development team to just drop off the face of the earth, like, the, the day of the planned launch. You know, make sure that you've got some time to, to deal with shifts in the launch date, because it will almost always happen. Yeah. And another thing is have checklists. As you're, as you're building the site, there are things that you know you're going to have to pay attention to on launch day, whether it's adding in API keys or checking that analytics are working, um, that the ad server is working, that commenting is working, um, all these things. So build checklists, assign them to people who have the responsibility of verifying that they're, that they're done. You could even do things like set calendar invites or, or if you use a tool like, um, like Basecamp or Atrium, you could like set up basic like, like tickets in your ticket system to make sure that people perform these actions and assign them due dates. Yeah, we always even go in and like just go look at how user, like the settings on user accounts and make sure that you don't accidentally have the ability for just people to anonymously create accounts. So, there, you know, it, it, work on a checklist and, you know, as you do mo lots of sites over time, like build it up and, you know, ours is probably about this long now. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we go in and just check every little thing, even if we are sure that it's been done, we, you know, we double check it. And another thing we do is what we call um, disaster scenarios. Um, so like, if you have a multi-server environment, plan for what happens if the database server fails. And the way you test that is, 
have your site running in the pre-production environment and turn off the database and see what happens. Um, and then basically you'll run through all of these plans, these disaster scenarios, and then you have like a book that you execute. Well, when the database fails, these are the five steps that I take. And by actually executing these scenarios, you, f you figure out what your process is because there's nothing worse than trying to figure out how to recover from something like that while your site's down and you know the pressure's on. So get that all out of the way beforehand and you'll feel a lot more comfortable when things go wrong. You could just fall back on this document that you've developed based on what actually happens when things, when things go to, basically go to hell. <laughs> and then there's launch. Yeah, running out of time. So you have to prepare for traffic. Hopefully you've done things like load tests and you figured out where the bottlenecks are and you've resolved them. Um, you know, is your monitoring working? When you do your disaster plans, it's really good to have monitoring on because you'll see, you know, does my phone get a message when my database server fails? You know, uh, throw a load test at it and try to, you know, try to overwhelm your web server and see if you get notifications that there's too many Apache processes or things like that. Um, did you remember to have a custom 404 page? Um, did you remember to theme your maintenance page? Because sometimes your site actually will go down, and if so, you don't, that the blue Drupal like sites under maintenance isn't good. Like, at least if you're gonna go down, um, have something that looks really good, maybe make a joke of it or something like that. Um, <laughs> You know, and then, you know, how's your caching? Uh, are your caches configured correctly? Um, do you have the right uh, TTL times, like how long these cached items are gonna stay in your cache? Um, does the cache clear reliably when you update content? Um, is your search index up to date? So a lot of things like that. So the big day, um, this is always a fun one. Um, Hopefully everything you've done up to this point makes this process go pretty smoothly, um, but you know, we've certainly learned a lot of lessons over the years. Um, you know, some fairly comical ones that we've run into is um, the client can't find the login to their DNS. They don't know who, you know, some, some IT guy that worked there like last year had an account at, you know, wherever, you know, GoDaddy or whatever, the, you know, wherever the site's hosted and like they don't know how to log in. So um, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it can't happen. So make sure that that's part of your checklist that you... It does happen. <laughs> And a lot of times we'll, we'll recommend that clients log into the DNS a few weeks beforehand and turn down the time to live on their DNS records because that helps with a, with a quicker propagation. Yeah. Um, um, and then also have a rollback yeah. strategy. Like, you know, we all like to think that nothing's going to go wrong and the world's great, but things actually go wrong. So think about what you're going to do. Like, if the site goes down and you can't get it back up, how do you recover? Can you revert back to the old site? Um, do you have a static site that you could put up in its place? So, so plan for these things. Yeah, if everything's gone really well, if you've done lots of great marketing and your site's awesome, um, you get tons of hits and you know your traffic will spike. So be prepared for that. Make sure that you can kind of take that first um, that first wave um, that comes in, um, and you know make sure that you've got your XML site map and everything up to date, and that the you know Google and other various search engines are are finding the content on your on your new site. And then there's the day after the launch. You know, all the adrenaline's gone, your site's up, and hopefully it's running well. So, so you know, assuming that things didn't go bad, like one of the, you know, what you should be doing now is just monitoring your site um, for performance and seeing how people are using it. Um, you know, what we like to do a lot is uh, we like to look on Twitter and Facebook and see if people, what people are saying about the site. Sometimes there are problems and you don't even know it and people are, are tweeting about it. And so you could kind of figure out what's happening from that. Um, Social media won't cut you any slack when it comes to those things. Um, you know, and then other things to consider is do your editors need access to the old site for any reason to get, you know, to, to migrate over other pieces of content, to verify things uh, from the old system to the new system because, so basically don't take the old site away, give them some access to it for some period of time. So that's it. And that's it. That's, uh, that's how to manage highly successful migrations. Um, are, are there any questions? Well, uh, there's somebody at the mic, so it, actually if you could go to the mic as well. That would Thank you, this was very useful for me. Um, talking about cleaning up content, do you have any recommendations on how we can get uh, rid of Microsoft Word <laughs> coding? <laughs> um, regular expressions, so the question is how do you get rid of Microsoft Word encodings? And a lot of times it has to do with 
either using regular expressions to strip them out um, or you know using some some type of XSLT like a transformation if you could get it into well-formed uh, XHTML or something like that you could sometimes use XSLT to transition the good pieces of content out of it and leave the bad pieces behind I was uh, I was asking if you can tell a little more about the estimation part. I know it's always a challenge to kind of uh, size the migration effort. So, uh, how much detail is is appropriate? <laughs> Usually, you have to sacrifice a, a small animal first in order to to get the gods right for uh, for estimation. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think really the key here is you need to be able to get a good look at at the source. Um, I think you know volume is is sometimes an indicator. Um, the different types of content, you know, if, you've, if you're building a, a new Drupal site and you've got, um, often the way it happens is there's, you know, there might be 12 new content types that you've created, but maybe there's only like five pieces of content coming from the old system. So just try to narrow down like exactly the kind of content that's going to come over. Um, you know, like I said, I, we really don't have a great way of doing it. We, you know, we'll do a lot of ranges. So, you know, we say we think it's going to be about this big. Um, sometimes we get surprised, I and mean, we've done some migrations that literally um, just take a couple of days, and you know the content came over really clean, and this it just it just worked, it just kind of went in r really nicely. And we've had others um, that really just take take a long time, you know, uh, several several weeks. Okay, yeah. Um, how do you usually mitigate against kind of the the hit you're going to take to SEO as you have all of these new pages that are out there? I mean, it's just like a 301 and rel canonical tags pointing back, do you map that out in advance? Or I mean, just at a high level, how do you usually mitigate that risk? Mm -hmm. I take that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly 301s is really important. Um, that's why, you know, when we said in the presentation, uh, some, sometimes just having a handful or, you know, 50 or 100 isn't good enough, and you really have to map every single URL. Um, or in some cases, you know, we, we will maintain aliases from, from an old site. Right. That's um, the best strategy, if you could maintain yeah. your aliases from one site to another. Even if they're not good, um, or you know, you don't like how they're structured, or they don't necessarily make sense, you know, you're going to suffer the least impact by not changing them at all. So then what you could do is you could leave <coughs> legacy ones the same, but have new structures for the new content that they're creating. Yeah, and then, you know, just like all the other SEO um, things, like make sure your markup is structured correctly and using H1s and H2s. I mean, I'm sure, you know, right. we've all been hearing presentations for years about that, so I don't need to go into details, but. And like I said earlier, if you use things like RDFA or, or microformats or microdata, that can actually help your old content as well as your new content. Hi. Hello. Um, this was a great roadmap for migration from the organizational point of view, but what about your customers that actually hit the site? How would you integrate them into this process, or would you? Yeah, that, 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 that's, Great question. that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, that probably, you know, we could have touched on that, it, and, you know, to be honest, we had a little, we had a hard time kind of figuring out what exactly what we want to talk about, because there's so many aspects to it. Um, you know, I think that's when um, you, you want to do usability tests. You want to get um, your audience involved um, very early on. Um, focus groups and yeah, things like running that. focus groups, identifying the the different audience types that are that are uh, reading your site. Um, you know, you can run usability tests on you know very early, like you know wireframes or design comps. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot. In fact, I'm sure there's been a lot of um, sessions here this week about that. So I'd encourage you to kind of find more out about that. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, w back when we had the, the slide with the funny guy from the, the 60s, the refresh and reorganize, like, that's kind of where, you know, when, you, when you're going to go and, and, and change a website and make improvements to it, um, certainly taking into account your readers and your audience is, is an important aspect of that. Yeah, I just wanted to get some high-level advice from you guys, so my current site is for a law school and half of it's static content that's semi-structured in Dreamweaver templates where there's a title and a content and a sidebar. And then the other half of the site is dynamic Java server pages that's actually coming out of a MySQL database. Uh, I was just curious for some kind of high level advice on a strategy to deal with each side of the website. So there's obviously countless ways that you could do it. Um, one way would be maybe to 
do a migration of one set of content into a format very similar to the other. So maybe export the data from SQL Server into a kind of structured format or take the unstructured, take the semi-structured data and put it into MySQL with, you know, with the other content. So that might be a way to help, uh, you know, write kind of one set of migrations instead of two. Um, you know, I mean, you could just also just have two different sets of migration, have, you know, either have different people work on them or the same people. Um, does that kind of get close to the answering of your question or? I think that really depends on who's doing it. Some people are more comfortable with like a command line tool and uh, some people are more comfortable with SQL scripts. Um, and then if you have, I think if you have like some, some Drupal talent, using the migra migrate module is probably a really good way to do it. And migrate, you know, you can, you can write different things to get it into migrate. So it can, you know, migrate can handle both the static files, uh, you know, or the, the database content. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of a technical question. Yeah. But going on what you're just saying with the migrate module, um, we we had a recent uh, migration. We went with feeds, yep. and the more I used feeds, the more I found that the use case of feeds might not be directed for migrations, but more for sure. other content uh, displaying and sharing. Yep. I was wondering what your recommendation is on feeds and migrate, and what the pros and cons were. I think in general, migrate provides a much better full end-to-end -end process for getting data in. Um, because it gives you, you know, you can intercept at all po at all points of the import, you know, through the node saves and things like that. So you can you can have a more robust migration where something like feeds is is strictly like I have a few different fields. I just want to put them in a few different fields. You know, I have a few source fields. I want to put them in a few destination fields. So just a very basic mapping. Um, so I think in general, migrate is the best, but it really depends on on you know the content and how much you have to do to it to bring it into your system. If you don't have to do much and you don't have much, um, I think feeds can work really well and be like a much simpler thing. You could, you could even do it without writing any code. But if there's a lot of translation and, um, you know, and, and kind of taking, taking disparate pieces of data and, and putting them together within the same node, then you're definitely going to want to use something like Migrate instead. But migrate also gives you a lot of like, nice rollback features too, right? Yeah, it lets you, you can, kind of play it, rewind it, it, it play it again. It keeps track of all the nodes that you put in and kind of lets you go in and see how many you made it and then you, you can wipe them out and start over again. Yeah. And I also want to thank uh, Laura on our, on our design team for doing all the, the fun in, uh, illustrations. So, thank you. Thanks.